Thank you, Mr. President. Today I, I arise to talk about an issue that affects the, the heart of our Constitution. Now, the Constitution begins with those three words, we the people. You can talk in any town hall across America and you can say, what are the first three words of our Constitution? And people respond, we the people. And they know that the Constitution starts with those words written in supersized font because this is really the heart of what our system of government is all about. Not we the powerful commercial interests, not we the titans of industry, not we the richest in America, no, we the people, the, the citizens, ordinary citizens, the, our Constitution, our system of government is set up to honor and respect and address the concerns of ordinary citizens. That's very different than so many other countries where our early residents uh, came from, from across the sea. So these three words capture the spirit of what our new nation was all about. Or as President Lincoln later summarized, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And I am coming to the floor periodically to address various issues related to we the people, related certainly to honoring the spirit of our Constitution. And in that regard, this week, I'm coming to the floor to address the responsibility of our Senate and its advice and consent role under our Constitution. The President's duty is to nominate a Supreme Court justice when there is a vacancy. And that responsibility is clearly written into our Constitution. And the Senate's duty is to consider whether that nominee merits being appointed. Now, in the early ages of uh, our country, as we'd gone from the Revolution, 1776, to the drafting of the Constitution, our founders were of mixed minds about uh, how this appointment process would work. Some said the appointments should all be done by what they referred to as the assembly, that is, by all of us here in Congress, so that the executive branch has a check on it with the positions filled by Congress. And others said, no, 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 that's too difficult, too much horse trading is going to go on. Uh, it, the responsibility needs to be vested in the president, him or herself. That's accountability. But what happens if the president engages in appointments of dubious merit, people of dubious character, people of dubious qualifications? And so they came out with this compromise. The president nominates. And our responsibility here in the Senate is to determine whether or not the nominee is of fit character. You can get a little flavor of this from the, the writings of Hamilton in the Federalist Papers, paper number 76. And he writes, to what purpose then require the cooperation of the Senate? I answer that the necessity of their concurrence would be a powerful, though in general, silent operation. It would be an excellent check upon a spirit of favoritism in the president and would tend greatly to prevent the appointment of unfit characters. So that's our responsibility, to vet the nominee and to vote upon determining is the individual of fit character. And that certainly can be broadly interpreted to include personal characteristics and qualifications for a job that requires specific qualifications. So that's our responsibility. Every senator here took an oath to the Constitution, pledged, pledged to honor their responsibilities here as they are laid out in the Constitution. So that is why I am so disturbed that at this moment we have senators in this body who have said, I am not going to do my responsibility under the Constitution. I am going on a job strike. I don't want to work and do my responsibility under advice and consent. I don't want to do the work of vetting candidates and voting on candidates. I'm just going to sit on my hands and, well, sing la 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 instead of doing the work the Constitution requires. That is unacceptable to my colleagues who are sitting on their hands and failing to do their constitutional responsibilities, I simply say,
do your job. On March 16th, President Obama nominated Merrick Garland to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. And certainly the President has now fulfilled his responsibility under the Constitution. He would put forward a nominee to fill this critical vacancy on the Supreme Court. I certainly look forward to meeting with Merrick Garland, reviewing his credentials, and learning more about his vision for the Supreme Court. That is part of the vetting process. That is something all of us should be doing. And then it's time for the Senate as a body to act. And that means the Judiciary Committee proceeds to collect information on Mr. Garland's background and on his decisions. And then they hold a hearing and they ask, members of the committee ask penetrating questions. Why did you say this in a particular opinion? He's got a whole record to be examined, and that's what we should be doing right now. Not since the Civil War have we left a vacancy on the Supreme Court for over a year. But the job strike my colleagues are engaged in today says we are going to leave this vacancy on the court. We are going to go on a job strike for an entire year and not do our responsibility under the Constitution because we just don't want to. That is a dereliction of duty, and I encourage my colleagues to rethink their position. Since 1975, it has taken on average only 67 days to vet and vote on a Supreme Court nominee. Just 67 days, or a little over two months. Now, there are some folks here in the chamber who say, well, this is a unique circumstance because we're in the last year of a presidency, and therefore we should just wait and leave the court spot empty for a year, wait until the election of next November and the new president to come in in January and then to get a new nominee and then to do hearings then. Now this is, that argument is an argument that fails on several accounts. First of all, there is nothing in the Constitution which says you only do your job in a year, well, if you will, a year that is one of the first three years of a presidency instead of the fourth year. No, that's not written in the Constitution. For any of my colleagues who make this argument, I'd be happy to read the Constitution to you, or better yet, read it yourself. Actually look at the Constitution and your responsibilities that are required under the Constitution. The President is required to nominate all four years, and we, here in the Senate, are required to proceed to determine whether that nomination is of unfit character or fit character. And that means vetting, and that means voting. The president doesn't get a break on his fourth year and told to do nothing, and we don't get a break on our sixth year. We're not told we should wait to make decisions in the sixth year because we have to run for re-election, and therefore we should wait until our citizens vote for the next, no. We have a term that runs a full six years, and we have responsibilities through the entire six years the president has a term that runs four years. He has responsibilities, or she has responsibilities through their entire four years. There is nothing in the advice and consent clause that says at a certain point in time, we're just not going to do our responsibility for advice and consent. I, it is conceivable the founders could have written into the Constitution that in the fourth year of presidency, the Senate will not fill any positions. But they didn't write that into the Constitution, and it wouldn't have made sense for them to do so because the work of the courts is ongoing, and the work of the executive branch is ongoing. And indeed, if we want any form of precedent, we can look just to the recent past. Justice Kennedy, who sits on the court today, was confirmed in the last year of President Reagan's final term, and he was confirmed under a democratically controlled Senate. I have not heard a single member come to this floor and say that if they had been here that, in that year, that they would have advised that we leave President Reagan's nominee hanging, unvetted, unvoted on, 
for an entire year waiting for the next president. No one here made that argument back then, and nobody's making it now. What we are seeing is a purely political effort to pack the court, to politicize an institution that shouldn't be politicized. We still have, from the moment of nomination through the end of this administration, 310 days. The average for after a nomination to confirm a nomination, 66 days. In other words, we have five times as much, many days as needed for the average to confirm. There is no argument, there is not enough time. A job strike based purely on partisan politics designed to polarize and pack the court is going to do a tremendous amount of damage to this important institution. Our founders laid out in the Constitution a vision of three co-equal branches. But colleagues, if you take the advice and consent power to undermine the ability of the executive branch to operate or the ability of the courts to operate, you are damaging in a serious way the equality of the three branches. You're saying that one branch has the power to derail the ability of the other two to function. That is absolutely, clearly, completely, 100% not the vision laid out in the Constitution. Not the vision that was laid out for advice and consent. Let me remind you, advice and consent was the responsibility to determine if a nominee is of unfit character. How can you determine if someone's of unfit character if you won't meet with them? How can you determine if someone's of unfit character if you aren't willing to review their writings? How can you determine if they're an unfit character if the Judiciary Committee doesn't hold a hearing to actually raise questions and ask the nominee to respond to them? How can we as a body determine and make that decision if someone's of unfit character if we don't hold a vote? Consider now the precedent that is being established and the damage it will do. So let's say, for example, that my Republican colleagues, by refusing to do their job, they delay until the next administration comes in, and it's a Republican administration, and they get a nominee that they feel is, has far-right views that they like a lot better than the nominee before us. By the way, Merrick Garland's views are about as straight down the center as one could ever ask for. He's been plagued voluminously by Republicans in the past. Justice Roberts said if you disagree with Justice Garland, you really have to look carefully as to why. And a member of this body, a key member of this body with been here a very long time, had said that if, if someone like Justice Garland was nominated, well, that would be a very reasonable nomination. So we have a very reasonable down the middle nomination. But what if this tactic of going on strike and failing to do your job works and so that you can secure in the next administration a Supreme Court justice that's way to the right? Well, first of all, it's been a clear and complete effort to pack the court. You have destroyed the integrity of the court as one that rises above partisan politics. But then along comes another vacancy. And you have a different president. And, or maybe the same president. And now the minority says, well, we're going to go on strike. Or maybe the majority is going to go on strike. Because they don't like this particular uh, president, or they don't like this particular nominee. And they say, we're not going to vet. We're not going to vote. We're going to wait. Uh, it's only three years until the next president. Let's let the people decide. We'll wait till the next president. Or perhaps if the Republican side succeeds in packing the court, and then the question becomes another vacancy, Democrats say, well, look, we have to restore the balance of the court. So we're going to absolutely refuse to act on the next nominee of this Republican president. This you can see. This precedent is a, not only a dereliction of duty, it is deeply damaging to the integrity of the court. It is deeply destructive 
of the integrity of the court. This is a path we do not want to go down as a body, exercising our advice and consent responsibilities, politicizing our judicial system, polarizing our judicial system, destroying the integrity of our judicial system. So I appeal to my colleagues, rethink the oath of office that you took to do your job and decide to end this job strike and do your job. Rethink how important of responsibility we have as a Senate to maintain the integrity of our institutions and that for short-term gain, destroying the Supreme Court, polarizing, diminishing the Supreme Court is not in the interest of our nation. I'll go back to where I started with our system of we the people. Our we the people constitution designed to create laws of, by, and for the people. Three co-equal branches of government. One creating laws, one executing those laws, and one determining whether or not those laws are within the bounds of our constitution. This action of trying to pack the court through a job strike is equivalent to shredding key parts of this beautiful document. It is wrong in terms of the short-term action. It is certainly wrong in terms of our long-term responsibilities. So let's end this show Let's end this highly politicized moment. Let's actually hold the hearing to vet the candidate. Let's meet with the candidate so we can develop our individual understandings. Let's review the candidate's writings. And let's gather here on the floor to vote whether or not we believe this candidate is a fit character or unfit character. That is our responsibility. Let us do our responsibility. Thank you, Mr. President.